Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Adult Sunday School. We're going to be looking at the text from Acts chapter 2 from Adult Bible Studies today. But today, I'm not going to use much of what's in here. I'm going to go straight from the text in Acts chapter 2, the story of the day of Pentecost. So let's start with a word of prayer this morning as we dive in. Father, as I read this story in Acts chapter 2 about the coming of the Spirit, my first thought, my second thought, my repeated thought is do it again. Pour out your Spirit again. Do it again on me. Do it again on us as First United Methodist Church of Fairfield. Do it again as all the churches of Fairfield. Do it again on the United Methodist Church. Do it again on the church in America. Do it again on the church in the world. Lord, we are at a place now where we desperately need you. Our churches are falling apart. Our country is falling apart. We're experiencing pandemics one after another, if not biological pandemics, ideological pandemics. We need you to pour out your spirit afresh on us. And Lord, hold nothing back. We need you. Amen. Okay, we're looking at Acts chapter 2 today. Uh, a great text. The first paragraph reading from the NIV goes like this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues or languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Here, here we are at the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is not a new holiday with Christians. It's an old holiday from the Jewish time, from ancient Israel. It was a time where they celebrated the giving of the law. Uh, it's a time that, that they celebrated part of their exodus from Egypt, the deliverance of God, the power of God in their lives. And it just so happened that God does what's described here in Acts chapter 2 on that Jewish festival of Pentecost. Now, why, why did it wait till Pentecost? That's the first question that occurs to me, because as Christians, we look, look at Jesus. Jesus had already done his teaching. He's done his ministry. He's already, already died on the cross for the sins of the world. He's already been resurrected. So why is it that back in chapter 1, Jesus says, wait? They already have the death and resurrection of Jesus. They already have his teaching. They have the information they need. Isn't that enough? Well, according to Jesus, apparently it's not. Apparently what they need, and going back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, what they need is the Holy Spirit. I, I don't understand. I don't know why God separated these events out. Don't know why that there's a separation, why Jesus wasn't immediately raised, why he was dead three days. Don't know why Jesus waited all the time from his resurrection to his ascension. I don't know why there was time between the ascension of Jesus and the pouring out of the Spirit here at Pentecost. But there was. And God's people were told to wait. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes on you, and the Holy Spirit will come on you with power. You'll be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. Now, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, day of Pentecost. And I see that they're all together. All, all the Christians are assembled together in, in one place. They're praying. They're waiting on the Lord. They're seeking his face. Uh, verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. I don't know if they felt it. It doesn't say they felt the wind. It says they heard the wind. They're inside. You don't normally hear wind inside a building, yet they did. Something's going on here. Filled the whole house where they were sitting. So it wasn't just a sound that was in one little corner. It wasn't just a sound that, that Peter, the leader, felt or heard. It filled the building. So they hear something. Then they see something, verse 3. They see what seems to be tongues of fire. Remember John the Baptist had talked about one coming after him who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Tongues of fire. Do you remember back in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses is out in the desert with his sheep and he sees 
a burning bush, except the bush isn't burning up. It's, it's burning with the fire of God. Or we go to the last verse of Hebrews 12, where it says, our God is a consuming fire. Here's a fire that's not consuming. And yet the presence of God is there with them. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them. These, these guys were mostly what we would call uneducated, certainly not formally educated. They hadn't taken their Spanish class, hadn't taken their Chinese or their Arabic, or as we'll see down below, their Phrygian. The languages they began to speak were God-enabled. God enabled them to speak these languages. Why? Well, let's see what happens next. Next paragraph. Verse 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, evidently the sound is not just in the room. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, in our own languages, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? So here's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come down on the believers, on all the believers. The believers are all there. They're together in one place. Holy Spirit comes. They hear a mighty wind. They see tongues of fire. They begin speaking in languages that God's enabled them to speak, languages they'd never spoken before. And what seems to be is all the people are then rushing out into public. They're no longer closed up in the upper room. They're no longer closed up in this one place, this one room, this one building, but they're going out in the streets. And the people of Jerusalem, the people who are gathered there from all over the Roman world, all over the world that they knew at that time, Jews that had been scattered since the exile, they're here for the festival of Pentecost. And they hear people speaking in the languages of wherever they come from. And it's amazing. These people are speaking those languages, but they have a Galilean accent. They look like Galileans, probably smell like Galileans, whatever Galileans smell like. And, and yet they hear the languages. It's strange. It's unexpected. unexpected. You see in verse 12, they're amazed and perplexed. Does anything happen in us, through us, around us? through our church that leaves people amazed and perplexed. Is there anything in our lives or in our life together that causes people to ask the question, what does this mean? Too often I look at my own life. Too often I look at our, our life as a church, a church in America, a church in Fairfield. And everything we do, everything we say makes sense to the world, the way we live our lives. The values we pursue make sense to the world. But I see here God breaking his people out of the normal, out of the expected, out of things the world understood. So they say, what does this mean? Now, verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Yeah, it makes sense. Weird stuff is happening. Uh, they must be drunk. They must be crazy. Must be insane. They're out of their minds. They're beside themselves. They've gone off the deep end. Now, as an explanation, it's obviously inadequate. Uh, I confess I don't have personal experience with being drunk, but when I was in college, had plenty of sweet mates and other people around me that uh, experienced and exhibited drunkenness. And sometimes certain language came out of their mouths when they were drunk. But it wasn't anything coherent. It wasn't anything that sounded like the, let's see, what's it say they were saying here? Uh, there we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Well, they weren't declaring the wonders of God. They were more likely cussing people out when they were drunk. 
you, it's not like you can go drink a bottle of German. Hey, I want to learn German, so I'm going to drink this German. Or I'm going to learn Phrygian. Um, glug, glug, glug. Hey, now I have Phrygian. That doesn't work as an explanation. So verse 14, we see Peter stand up and offer an explanation. The paragraph reads like this. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter is here offering an explanation. Okay, what's going on here? That's what the crowds wanted to know. And Peter says, this that you are seeing, this, this event, this phenomenon that you're seeing, this is what Joel was talking about. So he, what he does is he looks at what is happening in the current situation. And he says, this is that thing that we see back there in the Old Testament. This is what we see in the prophet Joel. Joel talked about this happening. When was it going to happen? Well, if we go back to Joel, the way Joel is, is phrased, both in Hebrew and Greek, it just says afterwards, later on. But Peter says, in the last days. Now, today we, we talk about last of days, and the last days are the end time. The last days are when Jesus is going to return. Any second, everything is going to end. There's going to be Armageddon, destruction everywhere, the last days. But, but Peter's interpreting his times right there in the day of Pentecost as the last days. The last days, what's God going to do? He's going to pour out his spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Okay, it's not just the sons. It's not just the daughters. It's sons and daughters, men and women. Your young men will see visions. Okay, young guys, you're going to see visions. You're going to see visions of who God is and what God's going to do. Oh, but what about old man? Your old man will dream dreams. The old man won't just be uh, cantankerous, won't be, just be curmudgeons, won't just be saying, well, is anything good to come out of Nazareth, that kind of stuff. The old men are going to dream dreams, the old and the young. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Not just a man thing, not just a woman thing. The, the, y'all, y'all over here today, the, you know, those of you who are listening, any men there? Yeah. Any women there? Yeah. The Holy Spirit is poured out on men and women at Pentecost. My prayer is that happens again now. It happens again here, that God will pour out his spirit on men and women in our church, in our community. And it'll pour, pour out the spirit on the young and on the old and everybody in between. And, and what are they going to do? It says they will prophesy. What, what is prophesy? You, usually when you think of prophecy, our most common way of understanding prophecy is foretelling of the future. Well, yeah, we see that happening. Some we, we might say Joel in Joel chapter two, this passage that Peter's quoting is foretelling the future. He's saying what will happen, what God will make happen. But what's Peter doing right here? Peter is prophesying. Peter is speaking God's word into the situation, giving God's word to address the reality they had there, the need they had there. So God today, I believe, wants to fill his people with the Holy Spirit so they will prophesy, so they will speak God's word into the lives and into the situations that are in our place right now, wherever that place is for you. God wants to apply his word right now. And Peter, God is applying his word, spoken hundreds of years before through the prophet Joel, through Peter. Peter is prophesying. He's speaking God's word into that situation. And then we see these really odd things, 19 and 20. Show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth below, blood, fire, billows of smoke, 
sun turned to darkness, moon to blood. Do we see that? When we read the text, Acts chapter 2, we see the wind. We hear the wind. We, we see the tongues of flame. We hear the languages. Do people come and say, oh, what's going on? The world's ending. The moon's turning to blood. The sun's turned to darkness. What's going on? And earthquakes. No, they don't see that. This language appears to be figurative. It appears to be saying this is an earth-shattering event. Now, when we say something is an earth-shattering event, we today don't use that. Literally, we don't say, oh, there's a major earthquake going on here. We're saying this, this is huge. This is humongous. This is something we need to sit up and take note of. But what's the conclusion in verse 21? The conclusion of, of what Joel said the conclusion of what Peter is saying as he applies and speaks Joel's word into their situation. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. What do they have to do? They have, have to say, okay, Lord, here's my offering. Here's my sacrifice. I'm giving you everything. All it says there is everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then Peter goes on from there. Next paragraph, verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. We've just finished a section where Peter has applied the prophecy of Joel to their, their here and now in Jerusalem, that day of Pentecost. Now he's shifting focus to Jesus. Okay, Israelites. Israelites are his audience here. The Jews there, the descendants of Abraham. Listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth. This guy from Galilee he was a man credited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. God showed that he was somebody. We, we can look at Nicodemus. Nicodemus, John chapter 3. Hey, Jesus, I, we can tell by, by what you say, what you do, that God is with you. Okay, we can tell God's with you. Do you do anything about it? Or do you say, oh, yeah, Jesus, nice guy, entertainment, free lunch every now and then when he feeds 5,000. Maybe a calm the storm. Maybe patting the heads of children, kissing the babies. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. God's doing the work through Jesus. As you yourself know, this is not news to you. This is not something unfamiliar to you, he's saying. Verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. So when Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was put on trial, when Jesus was condemned and crucified, God was not surprised. God sent Jesus. God came into the world in the person of his son, Jesus, to take upon himself all our sin, all our brokenness, our mortality, our vulnerability. And you, you Israelites, with the help of wicked men, oh, that's the Romans, the Roman Empire, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You looked at the works. You knew who he was. You knew God attested him to you, and he killed him. Is that a good way to win over your audience? Blaming them, telling them what they've done wrong? But then notice verse 24, that important word, but God. You nailed him to the cross. You killed him, but God raised him from the dead. God didn't let your condemnation of Jesus stand. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Jesus' death was not an, not an act. It wasn't, oh, yes, I am eternal God. I am immortal and invulnerable. I am just pretending 
to die. No, it was the agony of death. That's why Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt forsaken. He felt the pain. Freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Then we see this quotation from Psalm, 1, from Psalm 16. This prophecy, it was David's voice, David's cry of salvation to God, and, and yet Peter is putting it in Jesus' mouth. Next paragraph, verse 29. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. Oh, yeah, he wasn't raised. He's died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So here's... Peter expounding on Psalm 16. David, David died. His tomb's right over there. You can walk over. You can see David's tomb. He died. He was buried. His bones were gathered. But, verse 30, he was a prophet. He spoke the word of God into the situation, and that word still lives today. He was a prophet knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Oh, yeah, Solomon. Solomon was his descendant on the throne. Rehoboam, his descendant on the throne. Later on, Hezekiah, Josiah. Seeing what was to come, verse 31, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus, this Jesus that you crucified, this Jesus that you rejected and humiliated. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. It's not just Peter who's a witness. It's all those other first Christians who are milling around that day, witnesses to the resurrection. They've seen Jesus alive. Verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God. Last week, we looked at the ascension, Jesus ascending to the Father. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he has poured out that Holy Spirit. And that, people of Jerusalem, residents and visitors, that's what you now see and hear. You were looking for an explanation of these strange things happening, the sound of wind, the, the, the seeing the tongues of fire, the hearing the voices. This is what you're seeing. And we see that quotation, verse 34 and 35. Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110, the most quoted passage from the Old Testament and the New Testament. David says that Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning. Verse 36, Peter's conclusion. Therefore, let all Israel, you who are here today, you're here in Jerusalem, but also all Israel, wherever they are, whether they're here in the land or in exile, in the diaspora. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, not some other Jesus. Jesus was a common name. This Jesus, this Jesus whom you rejected, this Jesus whom God raised from the dead. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He is Lord, he is king, he is ruler. Peter's, Peter's preached this message. What happens next? Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. I believe this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Back in John 15, 16, Jesus has talked about the Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is the Holy Spirit working not just on the disciples, but now working on their audience, cutting them to the heart, applying the word of God to them. So it's not just one of those places where 
they'll leave after Peter's finished and say, good sermon, preacher. Nice message, preacher. They're cut to the heart. They realize the word Peter has preached is for them. Verse 38, Peter replied, you ask what you need to do? Repent, turn, turn, change your mind, change your orientation life, change the alignment of your life, change your allegiance. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Not just some of you, but every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, including your sin of rejecting him, including your sin of, of handing him over to the Romans, including your sin of being complicit and nailing him to the cross. And you'll receive, what, what are you going to receive? Just forgiveness? Just get out of hell free card? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you. You who are standing here, you who are listening to me today, Peter says, and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This promised Holy Spirit is available to all of you if you'll repent, if you'll put your faith in Jesus. So what happens? Verse 40. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Well, what do y'all think? Do y'all think that at the time of Peter there, uh, the, the 30, 33 AD, do you, do you think that was the only corrupt generation in history? You think we have any corrupt generation maybe now? I can't help but watch the news and say, yeah, it looks sort of like a corrupt generation. And the problem is it's not just the people out there. It's too often God's people. It's too often we rest secure in our own self-righteousness. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a good citizen. I mind my own business. I obey the law. I take care of my family. But we're messed up. Our country's messed up. We can't just put it past the buck or put it off on somebody else. My prayer today is that we'll see verse 41 happen again. And we'll see it happen here and now. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. My prayer is that God will pour out the Holy Spirit on us afresh. Do you want it to happen? Are you hungering it? Are you seeking God's face? Are you praying? Are you, are you praying, Lord, do it again? Do it in my life? Do it in my family? Do it in my church? Do it in my community? Do it in my country? What's going to happen to these riots, these protests that are going on around our country? If God pours out his spirit on his people that are there. What's going to happen if God do, does a work in our life and a work in our church that doesn't make sense to the eyes of the world? And people come and ask questions. That's what I'm praying for. So I, I guess I've done maybe more preaching than teaching this morning. But we need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Will, will you pray with me? Father, I know myself well enough to know I need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Do it again. Do it again as you did it in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. Pour out your Holy Spirit on me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this church. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your people. Those who are joined in this video class right now, those who will watch it later, those who are in our households, those who are in our neighborhoods, those who are in our communities, those who are across our nation, our world, set us free, Lord, with the power of your spirit. Deliver us from satisfaction with the status quo. Deliver us from satisfaction with the way things are, the way things have been, the way we've always done things. Don't let us be satisfied with anything other than a fresh move of your spirit in us and through us now. We need you. Deliver us from fear. Deliver us from anxiety. Deliver us from ourselves. Set us free as we experience the ruling power, the ruling lordship of Jesus. We align ourselves with him and his kingdom. We give you our allegiance afresh today. 
Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to seeing you all in worship this morning. See you all here on Facebook at 11. Bye.